Professor Greenberg, I'd like to introduce uh, you to the audience here. So um, Professor Greenberg is an Assistant Dean of Dispute Resolution Program, Professor of Legal Practice and Faculty Chair of the Cary Center for Dispute Resolution at St. John's Law School. Um, she's a mediator and conflict management consultant who has developed programs, educated, trained, written, and lectured internationally on the subject of negotiations, mediation, hybrid dispute resolution processes, online justice, dispute resolution ethics, and advocacy in dispute resolution. So we're super happy to have her here today um, to speak to us about third-party funding in IP mediation. Um, and uh, again, Professor Greenberg has indicated that she certainly welcomes questions at any point throughout the presentation, just drop them in the Q&A. And um, if I'm reading her foreshadowing correctly, she may also ask people to just write things into the chat uh, at some point during the presentation. So that might be something uh, fun to expect. So uh, Professor Greenberg, uh, the time is yours and thank you so much for being here. Okay, well, thank you, Roy and Carolyn and the rest of the staff of the Texas Intellectual Property Law Journal. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with you. Uh, I confess, I would prefer to be meeting in person and enjoying your barbecue and good music, um, but we'll have to be satisfied with having this take place virtually. So for the participants that are here today, could you please put in the chat um, from which state you are listening to this program. Let's see, just write in the chat where you're located now. Okay, Texas, California. Texas is winning, Arizona. More Texas, okay. Chicago, any place else? And I'm um, New York. So, um, so a different representation than if we were in, in person. So what I want to spend um, the time during our time together talking to you about is a very um, unfamiliar topic to many. Uh, third party funding and disclosing the presence of third party funders in IP mediations, a very um, provocative topic. So. Um, there was an old joke in the New Yorker magazine, a magazine that for me personally, I enjoy for its cartoons, less so for its articles. And um, the joke goes that a client comes into an attorney's office and talks about her case and says, um, okay, you know, Ms. Lawyer, do you think I have a case? Is this worth going forward with? And the lawyer turns to the client and says, hmm, um, how much justice could you afford? And implicit in that, um, in that joke, in that cartoon, is that, um, that justice is costly. It's not accessible to everyone. And when we look at um, IP cases, we see that, um, that the cost of litigating an IP case to trial costs between, um, costs between two and five million dollars. So if we were to update the joke and see what happens if somebody with an IP, IP um, case goes to a lawyer, chances are the lawyer would say, of course, which litigation fund you do you want to use because cases are so costly. So as many of you know, the good news for those of you who are going to be graduating, IP cases are on the rise. That it's estimated that alone 12,000 uh, intellectual property cases are filed in federal court compared to 6,400 commercial cases that are filed during the same time. So IP cases are everywhere. They're expensive to, um, to litigate. And lo and behold, who comes in and can help um, people with IP cases fund their cases? Third-party litigation funders. Now, third-party um, third funders are a really huge industry. 
it's estimated that they're between 50 and $100 billion industry and growing. And what, who are the third party funders? The third party funders are, um, are groups of funding sources like hedge funds who will lend money to litigants in a case based on the value of the case. In return for giving um, the litigant the money, the third party funder gets a large return if the case turns out um, with a good outcome. That is called non-recourse funding. And um, who are the funders? The funders are super lawyers. They are people um, who are partners of the top firms who, are, who have certain, certain substantive expertise and they've really honed their ability to ferret out those cases that have merit versus those cases that shouldn't even become um, a lawsuit, all right? What, what third party funders do, they assess the case um, in multiple levels. They use their lawyers, they have bring experts in. And for accuracy, third party funders have um, about an 85% accuracy in predicting which are the good cases. In their assessment, they look at the parties involved in the cases, the lawyers involved in the cases, and the area in the case, all right? And their analysis, they say, is proprietary. Each funder says they have the magic formula, and they know which cases are likely to yield a good return. So to secure a third-party funder, um, the case has to have merit. You have to have a, a good lawyer because third party funders make money. That's why they're in it. In fact, it's such a big business. Um, a respected third party funder like Burford is, um, is on the London Stock Exchange. Really big business. Okay. So let me go. So third party funders are everywhere, all right? And the problem is people are not aware that the cases that, um, that are in court, the cases that are being litigated have funders. Why don't people aware of it? Because there's a lot of controversy about whether or not third party funders, um, should it should be disclosed. Globally, um, there, there is general acceptance that third party funders should be disclosed. That's part of what goes on in litigation, international arbitration, um, mediation, right? In 2016, Hong Kong passed legislation requiring that third party funders be disclosed. But in the United States, it's like a patchwork quilt where um, even though cases are receiving funding, there is no consistent approach about whether or not these cases should be disclosed. Uh, it is, it, and there is a lot of disagreement. The, um, in the Northern District of California, they require disclosure um, in their class action cases in, in um, Wisconsin and West Virginia. Those are two states that require disclosure, but the court decisions on individual cases on whether or not parties are required to disclose whether they are receiving third party funding uh, is all over the place. But in IP cases, just, um, just this in August and in September, there were two cases where the courts required that the, uh, that the third party funders be disclosed. The first case was in the um, Southern District of California, Impact Engine versus Google, required third party disclosure. In another, in another case in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, again, 
the, the judge required third party um, funding disclosure. So disclosure and litigation, even though it is inconsistent, is a, is a real issue that needs to be confronted. And again, the controversy is it's none of your business. You don't have to know. What if anything has to be disclosed? Should, who, should, the, um, should the disclosure be made? Um, does the disclosed information remain confidential? And um, should there be different disclosure rules, whether you're in litigation, arbitration, or mediation? And what I am here to, um, to talk to you about is why in mediation, um, there should be third party funding disclosure. So um, one of the things we have to realize is that mediation as Judge Stark, um, Chief Judge Stark mentioned is a very different process than litigation. It's an informal process, uh, there are no rules of evidence and the way mediation works, if people come in and they are candid and have a business discussion about what makes sense. But to date, there has been very little talk uh, about whether or not parties in mediation should disclose if in fact they are receiving funding. And ADR providers and mediators are really um, unaware most of the time whether uh, parties are receiving funding. And I have called up and spoken to the major domestic ADR providers and none of them have rules requiring third party funding disclosure, even though they know it's an issue. And even when I've spoken to prominent mediators, they will say, no, 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 hasn't been any funders in my large cases. And there's denial that parties in mediation are receiving third party um, funding. And what is happening because of this? Um, this is a lost opportunity. This is creating an ethical minefield. And I, I hope this process stop, stops. So what I am, re um, suggesting is that ADR providers and mediators adopt a policy of please ask and please tell. Um, and for three reasons. First of all, if you do not disclose um, that parties are receiving third party funding, there is going to be an ethical collision. In mediation, to um, the ethics of mediation requires that conflicts be disclosed, that um, parties in mediation participate voluntarily. And part of that voluntary participation is that parties have informed consent. How in the earth are parties making informed decision-making if it is not disclosed that one, one or both parties are receiving third-party funding? Um, it also is important ethically because if a party is receiving funding, more often than not in the agreement, the party has to consult, keep informed, or allow the third party funder to be involved in the decision making in the case. If the party, um, if the if we don't know whether or not a party is receiving funding, um, does that mean that the third party funded is not, um, does not have to sign any of the confidentiality agreements that are part of mediation? Another issue is mediation. Um, unlike court um, litigation uh, involves all parties that um, not only parties, but influencers, people that um, can help in the decision-making process. Very much a third party funder is in some cases based on the terms of the agreement with the funded party, an actual party, and other cases, the party is an influencer. 
whatever the, um, however you characterize the third party funder, they should be participating actively in the mediation. They will also help in mediation, give quality of information and very much in an objective way share with the remedies. So ethically, media, um, third party funders should be disclosed in mediation. The other reason disclosure should be um, part of what goes on is the fact that a third that a third party funder is is um, is funding a mediation party shows that that funded party has power because it shows that the third party funder has vetted the case the case has legitimacy and it's worthy of receiving funding. Okay, so the question that's asked, couldn't disclosure reveal an imbalance of power that may drive a funded party to exert undue influence, um, we bully into the unfunded party. Um, so inherent, so in, <clears throat> I think that in mediation, there is a fantasy that all parties are equal, have equal power. And um, in reality, parties in mediation have different power. So um, what the so what the fun what the um, disclosure of a third party funder shows that if people cannot make a reasonable settlement in mediation. It shows that that funded party has the economic muscle and power to continue in litigation. So remember, funded parties, want, um, third party funders wants to, um, want to make money. And they are, they would, and for them, if they, they're happy to make money in settlements, in mediation or in court. So the idea is not about bullying. The idea is about um, legitimacy and, and staying power. Okay, so does that, um, that was anonymous. Good, all right. So the next, the next thing, just, okay. Disclosure also adds to the, ec the economics of um, a mediation. And let me explain. Um, several have, of you may have read in your um, negotiation classes, Bob Manukin's book, Beyond Winning. And one of the tensions in all negotiations is that, um, that people are afraid to share information because they feel the sharing of information will make them vulnerable. Um, and what Professor Manukin from Harvard says, to create values, you must disclose and share information. And sharing information about third party funding is one of those ways to create value because the third party funders assessment of the IMP claim um, merits may actually help settle the disputes because funders make decisions about the merits of the case significantly more objectively than lawyers or parties involved in the claim. Now, let me tell you um, a real life story because you may be listening to this saying, is this one wacky professor with an idea that makes no sense in the real world? Well, in, in the real world, very smart litigation funders um, do want to settle cases. They prefer settling cases at the earliest stage possible. And again, mediation is, is um, a dispute resolution process in which very savvy uh, participants can shape the resolution to get um, a good financial outcome in a way that minimizes the risks that litigation has. And like you have been hearing about in the preceding panel, litigation is, is um, it's a binary outcome. In mediation, 
the it's about making a business resolution then that makes sense makes economic sense given the realities of the situation so buzz weinstein is is one of um the third party funders who has actually gone into mediation and his funded party called him into a mediation because the other party in the mediation was not taking the claim seriously and when Bose came into the mediation and the other party realized that this case was legitimate, um, was, was funded by a legitimate third party funder, the case was taken seriously. Bose, by participating in the mediation, had an objective stance and was able to add value that, in, um, that made settlements a realistic uh, option in this mediation. So yes, third party, wise third party funders and select cases do are now coming into mediation. And, um, and yes, they add power and value. So, but what I'm suggesting is this should be expanded practice. All right. And, and that, and there should be three things. One, there should be titrated disclosure. What gets disclosed and to whom it gets disclosed is different at different stages of the mediation, as we will talk about. Neutrals, mediators um, should be educated about third party funders and how to work with them. I have gone, um, I have spoken to so many sophisticated groups and I am shocked about the number of accomplished mediators that don't even ask if people are receiving funding in their mediations. And three, ADR providers, whether it is the courts or private providers, should develop intake procedures and forms and promotional materials that make sure, and part of the information gathering, that this is a threshold issue that is asked. Now, let me explain each thing. So has there been any quantifiable change in those courts that have required um, disclosure? So um, that's a great question, Roy. And they are isolated instances. So the data has not been um, collected. Internationally, it's just part of the practice, but in the US, there's just a little dabbling. So there aren't um, enough cases to even say if there's been a quantifiable difference in court. But in mediation, where the quality of the information and the sharing and the candid discourse is so critical, um, it, 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 it is expected that it will change change the settlement commitment of both parties if, if it is disclosed. Okay, good question. So the, what I'm recommending is a titrated dis disclosure. And um, because at, you, you only need to know what the context requires. So at the first stage of mediation, during the contracting stage. I think you need to know um, if there is a funder and if there is a funder, what are the names of the funders in the organization? So as I had said at the beginning, the funders are the super lawyers. The super lawyers, the partners of the top firms who have been so great, um, so skilled at predicting the outcomes of cases that they have now joined um, third party um, funders to, to help with their expertise. And you wanna see, and since it is a, such a small universe um, and mediation is a really a small universe, you wanna make sure that there is no conflict between the third party funder and the, medi and the mediator. If there is a conflict, um, that needs to be disclosed to all the mediation participants. And like any other mediation conflict, the participants can um, decide to either to can decide to either um, waive the conflict or, or not to go forward um, with 
with that mediator. So why is it important to disclose at the beginning? As a mediator, um, in the beginning of, of my mediations, I'm always disclosing all the conflicts. And, pe and, and more often than not, people appreciate the disclosure, appreciate that it's a sign of the trust and transparency we are developing in the mediation process. But if we you take another scenario and say, what happens if there is not disclosure uh, that till after the conclusion of the mediation? So what happens after the conclusion of an IP mediation? If somebody finds out that the funder of one of the parties was friends with the mediator, the whole integrity of the mediation process blows up. Um, so one, to deal with the conflicts at the beginning. Um, and, and if the conflict is waivable, then the relationship of the funder must be shared with the other party. Disclosure level two, if the parties are continuing in, in mediation, in the contracting phase, what is the funder's relationship to the funded party? Um, and, and this is something that's very tricky because um, third party funders agreements are different and how they define what the obligations of the funder are to the funded party vary from agreement to agreement. Is the agreement written so that in reality, the funder is actually a party in this case. Is the funder the one who is controlling all the decision making? Alternatively, does the funded party have to consult with the third party funder? And, and um, before any settlement decision is made and is part of that consulting meaning that the third party funder has to agree um, with all decisions made or buy into decisions made. That, uh, so in fact, the third party funder is involved in the decision making. If that's the case, then the third party funder should be signing the confidentiality agreements that are a part of all mediations. Now, um, the other thing that needs to be cleared up at the beginning is what of the what information that the funded party shared with the funder can be disclosed in mediation. What is privileged? What is confidential? And what, even if it is confidential, will be important to disclose in the mediation, knowing that sharing will be protected by mediation confidentiality. Another very, very interesting um, issue, which, which um, is, as I had mentioned before, that many third party funders are hedge funds. And as um, successful hedge funds, they, they trade on information. In an IP <coughs> mediation, if the funder is a hedge fund, do you want to make sure that um, information they're learning in the IP mediation is information that they are not able to trade on in another situation. So confidentiality and um, characterizing the relationship of the funder to the funded party has to take place at the beginning of the mediation. Then um, as the mediation pro progresses, you want the other party and the mediator to know the financial relationship between the funder and the funded party. And the reason why is, um, as, as, as an earlier question said, could, could a funder bully um, create a power imbalance? And yes, a funder could create a power imbalance, um, and all power imbalances are not bad, but it's also a statement of the funded party's ability to go forward with the litigation 
if you cannot achieve a reasonable settlement in mediation. So it's more of a signal about um, a funded party's BATNA, best alternative to a negotiated agreement, and means the other party should take the negotiation, um, the negotiation seriously. And, and again, um, if there is, so, so the finances and how the finances affect a me mediation settlement or something that is part of most mediations, very much a part uh, of IP mediations if parties are receiving third party funding. Um, another value that third party funders bring is their case assessment. And this is very, very controversial. Okay, third party funders um, each claim that their own process of assessing a case is proprietary. Um, they are not going to want to share this um, with anybody. However, as we've been hearing um, earlier in the program, a very big issue in all IP ca uh, cases or assessing what the damages are, the strength of the case, and um, the presence of a third party funder sharing um, their case assessment without um, disclosing too much of their quote unquote proprietary assessment can help address the impasses in mediation. Now, something we haven't talked about is um, it's not uncommon or it's becoming increasingly common for third um, for both parties involved in an IP case to have um, received third party funders. And isn't that fantastic? Because if they're legitimate funders, uh, to, it's really important um, for them to share their assessments and for them to make business decisions about how, how two party, two funders with great reputations can come out with slightly different assessments. And that again can help the um, mediation resolution. Okay. The, the next thing that I recommend is, is there has to be training for mediators to deal with this. They can't keep their, their head in, in, the sun, um, in the sand, pretend this isn't taking place when it's taking place all over the place. Okay, what would it take on a practical level to implement this framework in a meaningful way? Um, this framework is, um, is so easy to implement because in, in all mediations, there is, um, there is intake uh, and there's a process for dealing with conflicts. And all that has to be done is just expand that to include questions about third party funders. Um, nothing, nothing more. Uh, okay. So the next thing um, which hasn't been discussed, which is there, is there's, especially in the US, there's um, a lot of biases about third party funders. And just like our international colleagues um, say realistically, this is just the part, um, an economic reality in dealing with cases. In the US, um, there are still, the world is, is divided. Some people still hold on to um, the, the um, prescriptions about third party funding with champerty and maintenance and say, yuck, this, is, this isn't right. Um, others feel this just makes economic sense. Mediators are human beings. They're supposed to be impartial. They have biases like everybody else. And part of their training needs to include how they deal with their biases, if any, about third party funders. And then the last and easiest thing is to just um, modify the, the intake procedures 
to make sure that th that that you ask, you tell, um, and the conflicts um, are are de are dealt with. All right, and so okay. So the unanswered questions in the field, which is very exciting. So I believe I'm about the only person that I have noticed that has written about disclosure in, um, in mediation, and it, which is amazing. People have been focusing on um, disclosure in litigation and arbitration. And um, during my time with you, I'm trying to expand the conversation by showing how given more and more of IP cases are settled, patent cases, it's 95% of cases are settled. Um, Chief Judge Stark talked about how his great magistrates are settling cases. Um, more and more cases are going into mediation. And for mediation to work and to have integrity, there needs to be a certain transparency um, and, and um, disclosure about funders. And, and part of why this conversation has been derailed is because um, when we're talking in the US about the ethics of third party funders and what it is and what it is, isn't, um, third party funders are growing, um, growing industry. And what they're trying to do is they're unregulated and um, they like being unregulated unre and they like um, defying characterization. And, and that is, you know, and that's a different discussion. But for those of you as lawyers who are going to be resolving your IP cases in mediation, um, you still want to have a process of integrity. And the reality is um, IP cases are being funded. Uh, third party funders bring information, invaluable information into the mediation process. And, um, and if you understand the value of bringing third party funders into mediations and feel comfortable with the grounding in that, it's more likely to happen. So what I would like from you, um, your questions, your comments. Anybody, is this the first time that from the audience, I have a question for you. Um, how many of you are familiar with third party funders? Just put it in the, just put it in the chat or just, it's hard to communicate. Or is anybody familiar with third party funders? Is this the first time you've heard about it? Okay. So, so Ken, do you want to, is, okay. So Ken and Trey and, okay, so we have, so Ken and, and Trey said they're familiar. Okay, so in your familiarity with third party funders, have you worked with them in mediation? So Roy, could you unmute them or? What's... I could uh, ask them to unmute, they may not. Okay. Do so. so here they go. So they both said not in mediation. All right. So so given what you've heard today, is there any reason? Um, what are the concerns about about having thirty part um, third party funders participate in the IP mediations? Trey or Ken or anybody else. Okay, so Trey would be fine with this. So hopefully next year's symposium, Trey could participate and talk about his experience um, ha having third party funders in, in mediation. All right. It's so, actually funny. Um, I don't know if hopefully Trey is okay with me disclosing this, but we were actually um, talking about having Trey present at the symposium this year, which is pretty funny that you you caught on to that. Um, he has uh -huh. a particular 
uh, connection to third party funding. So I'm sorry. I said he has a particular connection to third party funding. And what is was what is that? I'm not sure I'm at liberty to disclose, but if if you could share it in the chat if you want. Oh, yep, there you oh, go. Oh great, great. So so you were so the Trey, you so you work with the third all right. So am I right that they are super lawyers? Trey, if you want, I can actually unmute you and you can yeah. directly. That would be great. It's up to you though. Um don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> Trey said he would love to be considered a super lawyer. Um, okay, so we understand it's not. Um, I have presented with I have presented with uh, third party funders, and there is nothing that I have said that they have found objectionable, other other than describing the proprietary um, material. And Trey said. He doesn't see any mute button to unmute. So Roy, could you? Is there a way you could unmute him? You should see one now, Trey. I just got a, a button to click to unmute, and I have no idea if you can see me or not. We can't see you, and I don't know if you'll be able to turn your camera on. But you, I don't want to turn my camera on, so that's fine. <laughs> we can hear you though. Great. Um, oh. So, okay. So, all right. So, trade. So, do you? So, you, so you work with third-party funders. They very smart people. Yes. Uh, I think generally, and I think you you definitely hit the nail on the head when you referenced a you know unbiased look at at these cases. And one of the other things that I think is important to note about third-party funders evaluating cases is we typically focus on those aspects that actually influence, you know, the, the outcome of the case on a dollars standpoint and timing standpoint. Yes, yes. A, a dollars and st timing standpoint, which, which in terms of timing, you would prefer an earlier settlement that could come in mediation. Is that accurate? Yes. Uh, yes. Typically earlier is better. Uh, of course, you know, like anyone, you're looking at, you know, in theory, a, a lower lower return now uh, compared to a potentially higher return later and having to balance out, uh, you know, the cost benefits of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so third party funders, that's right. They, they, um, they favor mediation. They are often very involved. In, in selecting, advising um, who the mediator is, right? And how the, what the ap approach should be. So, so very, very much, and, and they love IP cases. IP cases are lucrative for them. So, um, and Ken wants to join, if you could unmute him. I certainly can. And anybody else, because I would prefer a conversation about this. I do. Okay, Ken, you should be able to unmute as well. Hey, hi, Ken. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'm not, uh, it, it, it is quite a, as you know, there's quite a spread from the Burfords of the world to the Deltas of the world uh, amongst the 50 or 100 major uh, funders that are out there and they're, uh, mm -hmm. Their, their approaches to evaluating whether they're going to fund and at what level are radically different. Burford, for example, will uh, has in-house people who are former uh, mm -hmm. people that I work with at one of my former law firms who are mm -hmm. trial lawyers. And they also, mm -hmm. if, it's a, if it's a big enough uh, situation, they'll also retain uh, an outside firm. So they'll have their in-house lawyer who's got IP mm -hmm. capability and a trial lawyer, and they'll go outside. Other funders uh, won't exercise that level of, of diligence. So there's, 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 quite a, there's quite a spread. Whether any of these people are super lawyers, um, I don't believe in, in, in trying to, you know, that, that's too subjective for me. I've been doing this for 45 years. So does that make me a super lawyer? 
I've been a partner in, in two very, very, very large law firms who have excellent intellectual property practices. I've been a trial lawyer for almost my entire career. Does that make me a super lawyer? I don't know. Okay, so so thank you for your comments. It's just I, I think the accuracy and I think you're right um, that that there are different qualities of third party funders um, and um, and 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 again, it's very competitive to get funded by the the top um, firms. Um, and when I say super lawyer, I, I'm talking about the ability. Um, the accuracy to with which they could predict the uh, the likely outcome of a case, and I think the top funders are able to predict. Um, I think it's the last I read was like eighty five percent, whereas um, some good lawyers it's it's as low as seventy percent. Um, so in, in my conversation with how they make the, their choices, it's, it is, it's multi-level, they have different processes and, and they do look at, um, at the clients and the, and the quality of the lawyers. And I remember in one of my conversations, I said, when you were, when you make a mistake of funding error, what is the re reason, you know, what causes that? Um, and, and, uh, and expectedly they said, oh, it's always the lawyer's human error, not, um, <laughs> that, that was the problem. Oh, well, that's, so. that's, that's, that's an interesting point of view as a funder. I'd probably blame the lawyers as well. That's one of the reasons <laughs> why, why outside, that's one of the reasons why outside counsel are always going to survive, particularly as trial lawyers, because, right, you get sued for $10 billion dollars. You go to your board, you say, well, I just hired law firm X. And then if it goes south, you've got cover. You turn around and say, well, I hired the best the best lawyers on the on the planet. Uh, I, I can't help it if they lost. So exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's never it's never the client's fault. It's always the outside counsel's fault. <laughs> one that's thing right. it's one thing that that uh, the other gentleman commented upon, though, uh, that I found interesting. Some of the big the big funders, the Burfords of the world. In a patent case, if you don't have four or five defendants and four or five patents because they're looking for maximum bang for the bang for the buck mm -hmm. on this, they won't yeah. talk to you. Yeah. They won't talk to you they're, they're, because you're just too small for them. If you've got two patents and you know maybe two defendants, well, then only a certain segment of the funding world is going to be amenable to even start uh, start to work with you. It's That's just the true. way it is. That that's right. Yeah, that very much so. So 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 the again the fund the funder you use is um, brings you a certain uh, leverage in mediation that that can help settle the case. And as Trey said, every funder prefers to settle early, um, which is why mediation is becoming a favored process. Right. I I don't deny that, but I. My experience uh, is, and it's very dependent upon the funders, but a lot of funders don't want to be identified. Exactly. And they, and they, and they write it right into the, into, the, into the contract. And so you can't identify them and it, gets, it can get very sticky because if the defendant gets the sense in a patent case that the plaintiff is funded, changes the entire dynamic of the, of the case. And the first thing the defendant does is they are in in front of the trial judge trying to break through that agreement that you're not gonna identify the funder because it's a huge pressure point. It's a, it's a huge pressure point. And then what do you think though, if they're identified in mediation? Well, if, if, you, if you do the mediation with a protective order of, from the from the trial judge that won't allow the identity of the funder to to be leaked to anyone, it doesn't really help because once the, once the defendant knows that you're funded, that's a, a huge pressure point. If I'm representing a defendant and I find out that you're funded and I find out what the limitation of the funding is, mm -hmm. it's huge. It gives me an, an amazing tactical advantage. So I'm going to be all over it. Okay, so so and what happens if you find out have a settlement and find don't find out till afterwards? Well, at that point, that no one will probably care. 
What, is that true? And, and dot, 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 dot. They may not, <laughs> the funder may not care at the end if it, if it, if it turned out, if it turned out well. It depends. So, so my, my prediction, my prediction is that when you do the next symposium, um, things will be changing that, um, okay, when, when I originally started doing this, that um, people said, oh, you're crazy. Then, then I was, then I was talking to the funders and then I found out which funders actually come into mediation. And then we would present together. And, and this wasn't, and as Trey said, they want to make, they want to make money. What they don't want to do is lose their competitive advantage and they don't want to be regulated as a business. So, um, so they are fine with, they are fine with helping achieve great settlements as long as they're not regulated and their competitive edge isn't lost. So, but let's, I don't, yeah. yeah, I don't disagree with you that, that like any, sensible point of for someone who is being funded um you know a, a good settlement is the best outcome 95 percent of the time because only two percent less than two percent about 1.5 percent of all patent cases filed in this country ever get tried they all yeah. settle at some point so sooner the settlement the better off in the grand scale of things you could you could say that's a generic statement of course it's subject to specifics but Good settlement early on is a good result. I agree with that. Yeah. So on, th on that note, um, I, th I thank you all. Great. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Ken and Trey, for being uh, willing to chime in. It was a very nice conversation to listen to. I enjoyed that. Um, and thank you, Professor, for your wonderful presentation um, and for fielding questions on the fly. That was very uh very well done of you, so thank you for that. Um, for everybody else uh, in attendance, we have about two minutes until our next speaker, just to give everybody a chance to stretch their legs and we need to switch captioners. We're gonna wait till um, 105 for uh, Professor Miller to begin.